Hey what's up guys it's Kelly welcome back to my channel. Today I'm sharing the six non-fiction books that I would like to read in 2021. If you find yourself enjoying this video then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up it really helps me out and if you're new here and would like to see more of me then please subscribe. So I don't read a lot of non-fiction. I read one non-fiction book in 2020. I think I read like two in 2021. <laughs> I don't read a lot of non-fiction but every year I make it my goal to read more non-fiction and I have so much non-fiction on my shelves that sounds so interesting but I just never prioritize it so I'm making this video to hold myself accountable. I've chosen six non-fiction books that I think I'll really enjoy. I figure six is manageable. In 2019 I made it my goal to read one non-fiction book every month and that obviously did not happen. But six, you know, I can read one every two months. That like that that seems a manageable amount to me. So I've chosen six books that just really speak to me at the moment that I'm very excited for. And today I thought I would share them with you. First up we have The Enchanted Places by Christopher Milne. He is A.A. A. Milne's son and obviously was the inspiration for Christopher Robin in the Winnie the Pooh books. This is a memoir that focuses in on his early childhood and his time spent exploring these magical places that eventually became the inspiration for the locations in Winnie the Pooh. And it looks at his relationship with his father and paints quite an in-depth portrait of A.A. A. Milne. So I am very interested to read this because on the back it does seem to imply that it's quite a positive look at, this, at his story, at his childhood. You know, it says that he's telling his story with humour and humility and that it paints the picture of a happy childhood, that it's a magical story and it's extraordinary and it, it does seem to be quite a positive story but I really feel like I've heard other instances where people have said that he almost resents the world of Winnie the Pooh because he, he does almost feel like his childhood was taken away from him to give other people a childhood. So I've heard these now two very conflicting parts of the story and obviously this is his story, like this for definite is the story as he wants the world to know it. So I'm definitely interested to see if there are any of those kind of negative things that come into this or if it is just, as it says, a story of a very happy childhood, him having a very good relationship with his dad and it also being wonderfully magical because we're going to see the inspiration for Winnie the Pooh. I, as of course most people do, love Winnie the Pooh. I definitely grew up more on the Disney versions, but as I've grown older I have gained a much deeper appreciation for those original stories and I just, regardless of how this book looks at things, whether it whether it is a very happy and positive story or if he does delve into those kind of darker aspects of the way that Winnie the Pooh might have affected his life, I think I'm going to really enjoy it. I think it'll be a fascinating story regardless of how it pans out. It is also very short, it's only 149 pages which makes it very unintimidating and that's good, I think I need unintimidating in my non-fiction and also I really enjoy narrative non-fiction so I enjoy it when it feels like I'm reading a story even though it's factual which is one of the reasons that I like memoirs so on the whole I think that this is just a really good place for me to start with my endeavour to read a bit more non-fiction. The next one is actually one of Alan's books that I had forgotten that we had but when I spied it on my shelf I was like yes need to read that and that is Fatal Females by Mickey Pistorius also is a local book so got that going for me because I read nothing by South African authors the whole of 2020. <laughs> I love true crime but I never read it. I don't know why. I love true crime shows and I love the true crime that I have read but it's just again it's not something that I ever make an effort to pick up and when I spied this I was like mm, yes need to need to bump that up on my TBR because it's about female South African serial killers. So Mickey Pistorius 
has a doctorate in psychology, she's a former police profiler, she's worked on more than 30 serial killer cases, she knows what she's talking about. And basically in this book she investigates more than 50 female South African killers. They have been arranged according to the type of case and I'm just going to read the contents page to you. Battered women, children who kill, female serial killers, infanticide, love triangles, murder for hire, poisoners, spree killers and stalkers. I'm ready. Like I said, I really enjoy true crime, but it does often feel like the focus is on male criminals and that's probably because there are more of them who get caught. I mean, if you look at the stats, there are far more men committing violent crimes than women. Is it because men are inherently more violent or is it just because women are smarter and don't get caught as often? Who knows? But you know me, always a feminist, all about that girl power. So uh, let's read about some women who kill people. Another one that I am super, super excited to read is Schadenfreude by Tiffany Wattsmith. For those of you that don't know, Schadenfreude is the joy of another's misfortune. So for example, a commuter barges past you on the stairs and then just misses his train. Your perfect co-worker doesn't get that promotion. A politician is caught with his pants down. Someone else's child is having a meltdown in the supermarket. So why are you smiling? So unless you are a really, really, really good person in a way that I'm not, you've probably experienced this, right? And it's, I don't think it's a case of, for most of us, just being happy when bad things happen to other people all the time. Like that, that would be mean. But, you know, if it's like someone that's wronged you or someone you don't like and something bad happens in their life, like, you do feel that little tickle of joy and you know that you shouldn't and you know that it's bad and normally you feel ashamed of yourself afterwards but it happens and so that shame I feel like as long as you're feeling the shame for it that's a sign that you're not a complete sociopath you're allowed to have that first instinct of being like oh yes someone else's life is falling to spectacularly to pieces and then you know, your rational mind can go, oh, I shouldn't be happy that another person's life is falling to shit. That's okay. It's okay. It's like we, we can't help our instinct emotions, right? It's your secondary wave of emotion where you, you think about it rationally. That's, that's what's important. That's what really tells you if you're a good person or not. So we shouldn't be ashamed of feeling schadenfreude, basically is what I'm saying. So Tiffany Wattsmith is actually a cultural historian and she's done a lot of studies of like human behavior throughout time and emotions and the way that emotions influence people's decisions etc and in this book she takes everyone from you know Nietzsche to Homer Simpson and she looks at like real world studies she looks at things that have been happening online lots of things that are happening on Twitter and in the end she determines that schadenfreude is not actually always a bad thing because it reminds us that even those we envy don't always get it right and also reveals a lot about what's important to us. In an age when we are so bent on perfection, it might just be the one flaw that can save us. You don't have to feel bad about it because it's actually a good thing. It's a good thing. So greatly looking forward to reading this book, partly because I think it'll be massively entertaining, but also very interesting. And also I'm all for anything that's going to rationalize the parts of my behavior that I know should probably not be there. Next up we have Stephen King's On Writing and one of my personal goals for this year is definitely to write more, not necessarily just fiction although I am working on a romance novel, but just to make sure that I am writing frequently whether that be blogging or journaling or working on my fictional work just to keep my writing muscle going and I think that this will be a big inspiration but obviously also it is sort of a masterclass on writing and it, it does focus on the craft of writing and I I don't know anyone who has read this and it hasn't made them a better writer or at least changed the way that they think about writing. Stephen King is also such a prolific writer <laughs> I feel like if I was going to take writing advice from anyone it would be him. I'm sure you'll see a cattail flicking around and possibly also hear it because it's flicking very near to my mic. It is also partly a memoir, so it looks at his journey from, you know, an unknown writer to one of the best-selling authors of all time, and how writing has shaped his life and changed his life, and also how writing was a big part of his recovery journey. 
It's quite well known that Stephen King has had quite severe issues with alcohol abuse in his life. The character of Jack Torrance in The Shining is apparently very heavily based on him and what he was like in sort of the darkest scripts of his alcohol addiction. I would imagine it looks a lot at how writing has helped sort of pull him out of that and give him an outlet to help stop him becoming dependent on alcohol again. Again, I think it will be fascinating because he's definitely lived a very interesting life, but also so informative and will partly just be a really interesting look at writing and at the craft of writing, but also very instructive and I think I don't think I can come out of this without learning some valuable lessons about writing and hopefully becoming a better writer, one, and two, developing a much better writing schedule and making sure that I'm doing it consistently. Next up is It's All Greek to Me by Charlotte Higgins. This I actually bought from a friend of mine when I was at uni because I was doing a semester of Greek culture and she'd done that course the year before and she had needed this. So I bought her copy of The Odyssey and her copy of this because those were the two texts that she needed for her course. And then I got to my lecture and they were like, oh yeah, you need The Odyssey. You, they never mentioned this book once in the entire six months. So that was great. But now I have this book that <laughs> sounds so interesting. So I am very interested in Greek mythology and in ancient classical civilization. And I really want to learn more about it and read more about it, but I kind of don't know where to start because there's so much of it and it's quite intimidating when you're sort of an outsider looking in because you don't want to start kind of just in the middle of a random myth if there's background information that you're missing or it's just it's it's very intimidating. So this book I think will be really interesting for two reasons. One, I think it'll give a nice overview to a lot of ancient Greek civilization and touching a lot on Greek mythology and it'll give me a nice starting point where I can kind of pinpoint the areas that interest me most and start there and start reading and researching more about specific parts of ancient Greek civilization rather than just like trying to fall into it blindly. <laughs> but more than that this takes ancient Greek civilization and it takes ancient Greek mythology and it brings it into the modern world and it looks at how their society shaped and informed our modern world. So the chapters are things like Why a life without Homer is a life half lived, Mortality in Hesiod, Homer and Sophocles, Democracy and the Polis, War in Homer, Herodotus and Thucydides, Greeks and the Barbarians, The Beginnings of Science from Thales? Tales? Thales to Aristotle, The Challenge of Plato's Republic, Desire in Homer, Sappho and Plato, and then it gives you a timeline, it gives you like a cheat's guide to the Greek gods, it gives you a guide to Greek words that have influenced English words or, or Greek words that we still use in English today. So I think as I said it'll be a great primer on Greek history but also just a very interesting look at a lot of the things in the modern world and how they are the way they are, why they are the way they are, and how they've been influenced by events of the past. And then lastly we have the chunkiest book on my TBR for this year and that is Marvel Comics The Untold Story by Sean Howe. So this really just tells the history of Marvel Comics. It shows how it grew from this tiny one-roomed office to the absolute mega giant that it is today. It looks at the highs and lows, its successes and failures, and how it's overcome all of those to be where it is now. It looks at how it went from a tiny publisher making comic books to one of the biggest movie studios in the world. It obviously focuses a lot on the people that made Marvel into what it is, so it explores a lot of Stan Lee's life, it explores a lot of Jack Kirby's life. I'm guessing it'll also talk a bit about the kind of cultural significance of comic books and how that's changed throughout the years. When comic books started as a media form like they were cool like kids read them and it was cool to read comic books and then they went through this dip in popularity where only nerds read comic books and like it was weird and if you read comic books people assumed that you were like a dork living in your mom's basement and to what it is now where comic book movies are 
like the one of the biggest industries in the world. There is no franchise in the world bigger than the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So on the whole I think that this is just going to be a fascinating look at the history of Marvel but I'm assuming also partly at the history of comic books and I'm just so excited to sink my teeth into this. It is a bit of a tome but I'm just gonna work my way through it slowly and it'll be really interesting to understand some of the history of how Marvel got to where it is today. I have probably mentioned before that although I love Marvel I do actually like DC more but I, I almost feel like Marvel probably has a more interesting story. If you do know of a book like this but about DC then let me know because I'm, I'd be fascinated to read their story as well. I'm very very excited to get to this one. I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating and it'll be nice to just have a deeper understanding of the background of Marvel so that I can have a better grounding and better understanding if I ever have to debate an elitist fanboy. So those are the six non-fiction books off my TBR that I would really really like to read this year. An honourable mention goes out to A Life on Our Planet by David Attenborough which I'm definitely intrigued by and I'm very keen to read but I didn't want to make a focus point in this video because as always one of my goals for this year is to whittle down my owned TBR so I'm really really honing in on books I already own and making those a firm priority but I'm definitely looking at borrowing the new David Attenborough from work and having a read of that as well because that sounds so good and I've heard such good reviews of it and we know I love the world, I love, well I don't love the world, I don't love the people of the world but like I love Earth, our planet, I love the physical world that surrounds us and I want to help save it. Very excited to read that one as well. Let me know in the comments if you have any non-fiction that you would really like to get to this year. Also if you have any recommendations for me based on the books that I've mentioned in this video then hit me up because as I said I really want to read more non-fiction and I have set a TBR of six because that feels manageable but if I could read even more than that that would be amazing so leave me some suggestions, leave me your favourites or if you don't like non-fiction then tell me why you don't like non-fiction. If you did enjoy this then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you aren't already. In the description you'll find links to all of my social media, that's my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Goodreads as well as my blog. You'll also find links to my Patreon, Coffee, Redbubble store and my online store if you'd like to support me on any of those and you will find Blackwell's affiliate links for all of the books mentioned if they are available. But that's it for me today and I shall see you all again very soon. Bye! My life is grounded in a firm routine of